what does criminal justice have to do with free enterprise? We Americans, we face a huge cost, both in terms of putting people in prison and paying for that, but even more so in the opportunity cost of not having productive members of society out here doing work for, for themselves, their family, and so forth. So there's major, major cost here. Um, and these costs are particularly high in the U.S. because we in the United States lead all countries in the percentage of the population that's imprisoned. And this is a sad state of affairs, in my opinion. And so this huge prison population is the topic of our talk today. Our speaker today is John Pfaff. John's a professor of law at Fordham University in New York, where he teaches criminal law, sentencing law, and law and economics. Before Fordham, he was a John M. Olin Fellow at the Northwestern University School of Law and clerk for Judge, Judge Stephen Williams on the U.S. Court of Appeal, Appeals. He got a PhD in economics, you see, this is what you can go on to do, um, and also a law degree from the University of Chicago. And um, his research focuses primarily on, on empirical matters related to criminal justice, especially sentencing, and he's paid particular attention in trying to understand the causes of the unprecedented 40-year boom in U.S. incarceration rates. His recent work, Locked In, which he'll be discussing today, has illuminated the previously unappreciated role of prosecutor prosecutorial discretion has played in driving up the prison population. John's book will be on sale outside the um, auditorium after his talk, and he'll sign a copy for you if you want. And finally, we will have Q&A after his talk. The Q&A is for students. So if you're a student, please come up and ask a question. And unless there are no questions, then other people can come up and ask. Questions are short questions. They're not speeches about, oh, I think this, this, and this, and for 20 minutes, and then say, what do you think about it? So ask a question, please. But uh, John would be happy to answer anything you ask, maybe. Um, so anyhow, here's John Pfaff, and I want to thank him for coming. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and so I'll just get started. So I've basically been obsessed with one question for the past 15 years of my career, which is what happened with our prison population? The fact is that the United States wasn't that interesting for a long period of time. If I was working in the 1920s, I wouldn't really have the job I have. Because from 1920 to 1970, prison population didn't really grow. The rate was about 100 per 100,000, 150 per 100,000, basically the exact same as Europe. We were completely unremarkable. It was so unremarkable that it was probably the worst timed article any academic has ever written. In 1979, one of America's most prominent criminologists wrote an article saying the rate would never rise above 100 per 100,000. And if it did, we would just adjust our laws to keep it below 100 per 100,000 and wouldn't let it grow much more. No. Right. What happened next was not a boom in incarceration. It was a slow, steady, unrelenting rise in incarceration for about the population has about 25% of the world's prisoners. Uh, there is no country with a rate as high as ours. Uh, when you combine prisons and jails, we have about 700 per 100,000. France has about 80 per 100,000 for basically the same crime rate. Right? The only countries that come remotely close to us are Russia, Cuba, Kazakhstan, places such as that. Those are our peers. Now, since 2010, there's been a drop. It's a small drop, but you don't turn this thing around on the dime. That said, it's not much of a drop. And prison reform is, even today, one of the truly bipartisan issues out there, genuine bipartisan issues. So in the one of the few things we can agree on, we don't have much to show for, and it's worth asking why. Before I get into that, though, there's one other point I want to make, which is why this decline is important. Right? Some might say, well, this is good. Right? This is what we need to fight crime. And that's wrong. Prison as a way of fighting crime is a very bad way to fight crime. So whether you, whatever, one's ideology, prison growth is not the solution. Unfortunately, that's not how we argue for reform. We tend to argue for it very, very badly. Uh, and it's, I've long feared it was going to blow up in our faces, and it just did. So here's how you don't argue for prison reform. You don't say, hey, look, crime's going down, prison's going down, so we can keep prison going down because crime is going down. Because the fact of the matter is, if crime is going down, prison should go down. If crime is going up, prison should probably go down, because it's not a good way to fight crime. But this is what major groups like Pew and the Brennan Center and other leading national organizations do, is they keep hounding this point. You can cut both at the same time. Implicit in that 
is that if crime starts going up, the justification for reform goes away. And that just happened in Alaska. Last year, Alaska passed a wide range of reforms. And this year, their crime rate went up. Not because of reforms, because of a faltering economy due to bad oil prices and the opioid crisis. But it didn't take much to convince legislators and their constituents that the bill needed an overhaul. We've had a spike in crime, said a representative. It's really not been a happy outcome. Right? This is exactly what I feared would happen. If you say, look, we can cut crime and prisons, when crime goes up, the argument for cutting prisons goes away, and then your reform bills will die. They repealed parts of the bill that had not yet even gone into effect. Right? There are things that weren't supposed to start until 2019, 2020, but they got rid of those too, just out of fear. So, how do you argue for reform? Well, the first point you make is that prison is just a bad way to fight crime. It's just not an efficient way to reduce it. Right? So the best paper out there I can say says, look, in 1979 to 1990, they show that there's a pretty big crime prison effect. When crime was high and prison was low in the 70s and 80s, prison kind of worked. It was a blunt tool, but it worked. But they say, since 1991, the effects are much smaller. And by much smaller, if you read the paper, they mean close to zero. Right? It's just not an efficient way to fight crime. In fact, it gets worse. The empirical results indicate that incarceration generates net increases in the frequency and severity of recidivism, worsens labor market outcomes, and strengthens dependence on public assistance. It's an arms race. Every year, every month, every week, every year you spend in prison keeps you committing crimes while you're in prison, but increases the risk you commit a crime once you get out. And in fact, in short, it seems incarceration's before effect, deterrence, is mild to zero. There's almost no deterrent benefit from prison. While the after, the increased recidivism, cancels out the during incapacitation. You don't deter, and whatever you gain from locking them up while they're locked up, you lose that because they're worse for wear when they leave. It's just not good public policy, whether you're tough on crime, smart on crime, indifferent to crime. Second, there are staggering social costs to incarceration that we barely begin to talk about. Right, when we talk about the cost of prisons, we talk about the $50 billion a year we spend on incarceration, the cash, the actual government outlays that are spent on prisons. But that's just the tip of a massive social cost iceberg. Physical and sexual abuse while in prison that we barely begin to record and can't really measure. The risk of drug overdose after release. The risk of dying from a drug overdose skyrockets shortly upon release from prison. Because while in prison, you're taking low quality drugs that are very expensive. But they don't actually treat your underlying addiction problems. When you get released, the price of drugs goes down, the purity goes up, your tolerance has gone down, and the risk of death goes up significantly. People who have gone to prison earn less per hour upon release, work fewer hours, and see their income take a serious hit. 30, 40, 50% decline in income. Broader macro distortions. Entire neighborhoods get cut off from the primary labor market because so many people are detached from that market that the market as a whole loses connections. We like to think that we get our jobs in terms of our arm's length, like I just set my resume out there and the market picks me because I'm the best person, but that's not true. Right? We all get jobs through connections. I know a guy who knows a guy who passes my resume on to someone. But when so many people are cut off from that market, there is no one to pass your resume on to and it actually distorts entire neighborhoods. Prisons are a vector for STDs, HIV, and tuberculosis. People often come out sicker than they went in, and that is horrible for them, but also increases public health care costs, because I have to treat the diseases that they're getting because they're in unhygienic conditions, crowded together, and it's a great transmission for diseases. In New York State, half of all prisoners come from New York City, and half of our maximum security prisons are at least 200 miles away from New York City. There is not a single prison located in New York City. Phone call costs, ho hotel costs, transportation costs, lost income costs while you're going to visit your family. These are all costs. And then lack of social contact is believed to increase the risk of recidivism upon release. So we take them far away from their families, destroy those familial contacts, then send them back with those contacts sprayed in that surprise when they reoffend. Just the emotional costs. These things matter. Right? Having someone locked up imposes tremendous shame and emotional pain on the families who have themselves not done anything wrong and are victimized by often unnecessary incarcerations. It increases the risk of children reoffending if their parents are in prison. Right? We haven't begun to even estimate what these costs are, but I guarantee you they dwarf the $50 billion you spent on money. Right? So if you're doing a cost-benefit analysis, we're ignoring all the costs. And these costs are huge, and they're all avoidable, because we can use other ways to reduce crime that keep the crime rates down, but don't impose all these costs on us. It goes so far as to actually make marriage and family formation difficult. In order for people to date the people who live near them, and for those marriage markets to work, you need like a 50-50 gender ratio for them to function properly. And in certain high enforcement communities, so many young men are in prison that the male-female ratio shifts from 50-50 to 40-60. Four men for every six women. 
And there's clear indications that, that makes it hard for families to form, hard for marriage to start, and actually undermines general neighborhood health. These are staggering and generally completely ignored costs. So doesn't work, imposes huge costs. So what should we do? Well, there's a lot of things we can tell about things that actually work. Right? It's not just what prison's bad, let's not do it. It's that prison's bad and other things work better. Right? So our estimates imply that a dollar spent on policing is associated with about a dollar sixty in reduced victimization costs. Policing works far better than incarceration does. And because policing works by deterring crime, the victimization doesn't happen, and then all those costs of punishment don't happen as well. Right? So you reduce the crime without all the extra costs, without even the crime happening in the first place. Maybe you don't even need policing. This is a graph of this program called Ceasefire or, or Cure Violence in Chicago. This is violence in Chicago, gun violence in Chicago. The downward slope is when they funded Cure Violence. The blue arrow is where they cut Cure Violence's funding, and then you can see what happens to gun violence in Chicago when they cut Cure Violence's funding. And Cure Violence works not with the police, but by having former gang members and former people who are involved in criminal justice talk to someone when a shooting happens. Bullets move like a disease. A shoots B, B shoots back at A and hits C, C's friends retaliate and hit D. One study found that 400 shootings in Chicago all tied back to one single initial shot. And then the, the retaliation spread to the social network. In Cure Violence, relying on no police officers at all, sits down and talks to A when A gets hit and says, what can we do so that you don't shoot back at B? And it works. It's worked in Chicago, it's worked in New York, it works in, it's worked in I think, Venezuela, it's worked in a lot of places. Local groups work. A recent book came out saying the fact that local nonprofit groups that responded to violence in New York City by cleaning streets, building playgrounds, mentoring children, and employing young men had a real effect on the crime rate. Right? Just providing opportunity, providing jobs. Employment is a major pathway out of crime, far more than the threat of going to prison. Medicare expansion. Volger estimates that the ACA's Medicaid expansion resulted in a cost savings of $13.6 billion in reduced crime. Drug treatment. Thousands of people with drug problems got access to treatment, and when treated, didn't get drunk and engage in domestic violence, get in a bar fight, have a DUI, rob a bank to, to, to feed their drug habit. Right? There are things that work, and they work better than prison. So we're not, we have this massive rate that no one else has, and we don't actually need it to stay safer. Right? It's just bad policy and incredibly harmful. So we have this drop. We should have this drop. From a policy, public safety point of view, this drop should be bigger. It's a genuine bipartisan desire to make it bigger, and it's really not that big. So why? What's keeping one of the few genuinely bipartisan issues from actually accomplishing what it should be able to accomplish? We're about 10 years in reform now and have very little show for it. To start, it's important to realize that it's not really actually a national decline. It's even worse than that. What I'm going to show you is decline by state. How many state prisoners has each state released? One of these states is California. The rest are not. Let's see if you can guess which state is California. The United States has not decarcerated. California has decarcerated. 24 other states have tagged along for the ride, and 25 states have more people in prison now than they did in 2000. Right? They're worse. But it's in 2008, right? So basically, in 2010, there are 1.4 million people in prison. Since then, we've shed about 77,000. That's something to celebrate. Take out California alone. 35,000, cut in more than half. Take out California and the next four states, and there's been no decline at all. Right. This is not some giant national success. It's more faltering than even the small decline seems to suggest. And the reason why I think this is, I think there are three who's that we're ignoring. That we tend to focus on the wrong thing. We focus on things that matter, but don't matter as much. And by focusing on things that don't matter as much, we ignore the things that matter a lot more. So the prosecutor. We never talk about the prosecutor. They're actually the most important actor in this whole story, and we don't discuss them. When Hillary Clinton rolled out her end-to-end -end criminal justice reform proposal in the 2016 campaign, she talked about policing, and she talked about parole. That's not end-to-end. -end. That's end-and-end. -and, and she jumped over the middle. But the middle is where everything's actually happening. And I don't mean to pick on her for that. Everyone jumps over the prosecutor. Violence. We talk all the time about the low-level nonviolent drug offender and the need to get the low-level nonviolent drug offender out of prison. And the low-level nonviolent drug offender should not be in prison. But the total percent of people in prison for drugs is 15%. 55% are in prison for violence. Unless we change how we punish violence, there's a very hard cap on how far our prison populations will shrink. And it's going to keep us as the world's largest jailer. In the public sector, 
If there's one thing I don't want to talk about anymore, except when I talk about it here, it's a private prison. They don't matter. They're about 8% of all people are held in a private prison. 92% are held in a state prison. But by focusing on the private prisons, we ignore the fact that the people who really fight resistance are not the private sector firms. It's the guard unions and the politicians who have prisons in their districts. It's a public sector failing, not a private sector failing. Yet by focusing on the privates, we completely ignore the publics. So we'll go through each of these. The prosecutor. So looking over the range 94 to 2008, which is chosen mostly because that's when we have data. One of the challenges doing empirical work on criminal justice is our data is disastrous. Um, but this is actually a relevant, useful period. During the 90s and 2000s, crime went down, and serious crime went down a lot, but prison still went up. So crime down. Serious violent crime drops by 25 30%. Serious property crime drops by 25 30%. And in fact, especially if you take out marijuana arrests and never send people to prison, total arrests go down as well. Fewer and fewer people are entering the criminal justice system every year. Yet somehow, prison publishing go up and up and up. But one thing we see rising is even if we have fewer arrests, we have more felony cases filed in state court. So there's fewer and fewer people walking into the DA's office. But more and more people are being charged in court with a felony offense, the type of crime that sends you to prison. Once we charge you with a felony, the chance that you actually go to prison doesn't change that much. And once you go to prison, the amount of time you spend in prison, that actually, contrary to what you hear, doesn't change that much either, and it's not that long. The median time spent in prison for someone convicted of a property or a drug offense is a single year. The median time spent in prison for a violent crime is four years. Of those who are spending, if the only offense where time has really gotten long is murder. Right? That's the one offense where time has gotten long. Those who have spent at least 10 years in prison, half are in for murder. If you spend at least 20 years in prison, two-thirds are in for murder. It's not these low-level drug cases spending life without parole in prison. It's murder. And we should cut back on the amount of time murder spent in prison. From a public safety point of view, a murderer does not need to be in prison for 20 years. Maybe morally you think that's what they deserve. That's fine. But if your goal is public safety, this is not justifiable. But that's where the long sentences are. Everything else is short. The one thing that changed in any meaningful way was this felony filings in state court. And that's completely within the discretion of the prosecutor. Completely unreviewable, no oversight, no one controls them. They're directly elected by county electorates. They do what they want, and they become harsher. So the question is why? What made prosecutors tougher? The honest answer is no idea, um, because we have almost no data on prosecutors. We have data on crime, data on police, data on arrest, data on prisons, but prosecutors, almost nothing. In fact, my prosecutor data came from the court system. The DAs share nothing, but as soon as that case hits the courts, the courts gather data. So understanding what DAs do, it's kind of guesswork, because they share nothing. And as I'm starting to learn, they also tend to gather nothing internally either. So it's not like they're hoarding it, we just don't have it. But there are some theories we can point to. One is weak in public defense. 80% of all defendants facing prison or jail time qualify for a state-provided lawyer. But we systematically underfund public defense. We spend $200 billion a year on criminal justice. We spent about $4.5 billion on public defenders. At least we did in 2007. That's the most recent year of data we have. $4.5 billion on public defense, $6 billion on prosecutors. But it's worse. Because prosecutors get a whole bunch of free services defenders don't get. DNA lab, investigative services. Public defenders have to hire an investigator. Do you know who we call the DA's investigator? We call it the police department. Right? They don't have to pay for that. A study in North Carolina found that if you look at the nominal budgets, the public defenders and DAs have identical budgets. By law, their budgets are the same. If you count all the free services DAs get that public defenders don't, the DA budget is triple that of the public defenders. Yet we spend almost nothing on this, and no one really seems to care. And liberals and Republican servers alike gut legislation to improve pub in the public defense all the time. So it's, it's a serious problem. It gives the DAs a strong upper hand. Tougher sentencing laws. People aren't spending more time in prison. But the sentencing laws get tougher, and so plea bargains go faster. Right? No one goes to trial. Right? If you watch Law & Order, the original, I can't speak to the, the spin-offs. The original, the law is actually quite good. They actually get the law right. It actually bailed me out on a law school exam once where I blanked. But they remember the DA said this, judge said that, DA said this, judge said that. He got the conviction, so I thought the gun was allowed in. That was my second best grade in law school. So the law, I don't recommend using Law & Order to study for law school, but it works. Um, Obviously, I believe your professor, if you say, if I watched less Law & Order, I probably wouldn't have blanked during the exam. Um, but every episode also ends with this big, dramatic courtroom trial. Right? But that's not how a single case ever ends. Right? 97% of all guilty verdicts are from a plea bargain. Some dingy room, you're signing a piece of paper, and the case is over. And these plea bargains might be easier to do 
as you can threaten more and more. Right? Take this four-year deal or face 10 years. Take this four-year deal or face 15 years. Take this four-year deal or face 50 years. As those threats get bigger, right, the pleas come faster. Right? So no one's spending more time in prison, but we're scaring defendants to plead out more quickly. But I think the most compelling argument is arguably the most boring. And that's kind of a dominant theme in my work. The things that matter most are always the things that are most boring. That's why they matter. Right? If they're interesting and cool and people want to talk about them, then we actually tend to fix it. Right? But it's the kind of thing where I say, hey, let me talk to you about the census, and you run away at a party, as you would wisely do. Right? That's why it matters. So I'm going to talk to you about the census. I'm going to talk to you about like, staffing levels. Right? These are the things that actually matter because they're boring, and so no one ever wants to actually address them. Right? It's cool to walk in and say, I am a death penalty litigator, but only 3,000 people are on death row and 9 million people are under observation. You're not actually fixing the real problem. So as a staffing story, well, there's two ones. One, in urban counties, with this massive hiring spree as crime went down. Between 1970 and 1990, as crime goes way up, we hire about 3,000 more prosecutors, from 17,000 to 20,000. An improvement, but not much. Over the 90s to 2000s, as crime goes down, we hire 10,000 more prosecutors. It's a massive increase in staffing, almost all of it in major urban counties. And we don't have good measures of DA productivity, but every sort of proxy I can use tells the exact same story. That the assistant DA sitting at his desk today is no more aggressive than that same assistant DA sitting at his desk in 1990. There's just 10,000 more of them. We send 600,000 people to prison every year. We arrest somewhere between 10 to 14 million people every year. If you're an ADA at your desk and you need to find some case to charge to keep your job, there are 14 million arrestees you can turn to to fill 600,000 beds that we're going to fill up. There's always someone to charge, and there's always someone we're hiring to do that. In rural counties, it's a different story. Between 1970 and 2008, the number of counties with a full-time prosecutor goes from 45% to 85%. Right? That's not Brooklyn. Right? We've had a full-time DA since before 1970. Right? But in more suburban and more rural areas, the DA goes from sort of a part-time guy with a private practice on the side who handles cases for the county on a contract basis to the DA. This is his job. This is how he pays his mortgage. This is how he feeds his children. It's, his entire income is being the DA. It's surely going to make them more aggressive. And it's perhaps not surprising that while what decarceration we're seeing is almost entirely an urban phenomenon, Rural counties are getting tougher and tougher, even today. And finally, the end, you know, probably the biggest problem for why prosecutors are so aggressive, it's us. Right? We're a very punitive country. We send people to jail for not paying their library fines. Right? Counties across America, if you don't pay your library fine, you can go to jail. I can guarantee you Brooklyn is not one of those counties, or I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> like, I guarantee you I would, in fact, today not be here because um, of the seven books we haven't returned yet. Um, but many places will lock you up for not returning a library book. Right? We're punitive. We're very harsh. We've always been very harsh. And DAs are elected. We're the only country in the world that elects as DAs. The only country. We don't pay close attention, but we like things to be harsh. And the DAs as elected officials respond to that. Some of these things we can fix, right? We can make DAs not be elected. We could try to scale back some of our tough sensing laws. We try to scale back the size of offices. There are ways to address this, but so far no one's talking about this at all. Right? They're just not on our reform radar, um, but they are the ones who drive this process more than any other actor in the system. There is one upside to this, however. So in the 2016 election, when returns came in on November, a lot of reformers are very scared. Right, Trump had campaigned on a very tough on crime, you know, violence is rising campaign. What did this mean for, for reform? I wasn't concerned, and so far my lack of concern has been borne out, because DAs are local officials. Right? They respond to county pressures, and they don't really care about the state, and they certainly don't care about the federal rhetoric. They care about local issues. And in fact, when you look at decarceration, what you see is that not only has it not been that they know most states haven't decarcerated, but even within those states, it's not the state that decarcerates. It's the counties that decarcerate. We're not going to solve this with one federal bill. We're not going to solve this with 50 state bills. It's going to take going to 2,000 different DA offices and convincing each DA to change. So this map I'm going to show you shows you the change in the number of people from that county being sent to state prison between 2010 and 2014. If the county is orange, it's sending fewer people to prison. If the county is blue, it's sending more people to prison. So reform likes orange, doesn't like blue. What you're going to see on this map 
is that except for California and a few other states, you actually can't recognize the states. Other than California and Mississippi, which fixed things the following year, it's not that any state went in one direction or the other. Counties in some states did. New York has the longest sustained decarceration in America since 1999. But New York State didn't decarcerate. For most of the time, just New York City did. And everyone else got harsher. All right, that's kind of the story we see. It's a very local phenomenon. And it's required very local approaches. The election of reform-minded DAs is one promising start. But there are other steps you have to take to really think about how do you change behavior at a very local level. But there's no federal and no state level silver bullet that's going to fix this. It's going to require a lot of local effort. And that protects you from bad policies from the top, but also means there's no good policy from the top that's going to solve this off the bat. But like I said, so far, prosecutors are almost completely off our radar for what we're talking about. Next, drugs. Whenever I tell people I study prison growth, they give me this look like, oh, you academics studying things that are always so obvious. It's just the war on drugs. Like, I haven't heard of the war on drugs and should write that down and look into this war on drugs thing that people are talking about. Here's the reality of the war on drugs. It's true. Between 1980 and 1990, the percent of people in state prison for drugs went up. From 5% to 22%. And since 1990, the share of people in prison for drugs at the state level has fallen to about 15%, so where it is today. Most people in prison are not there for drugs. Most people admitted to prison are not admitted for drugs. The majority of them who are in prison, and a close majority who are admitted, are there for violence. To 1980 and 2009, we added 1.1 million people to prison. That in and of itself is a staggering number to contemplate. Right? The population in prison in, 19, in 2009 was 1.1 million more than the population in 1980. Of those, about 21% of that increase were people in there for drugs. 51% of the increase were people in there for violence. When I say this, and say prison growth is driven by violence, not drugs, I get two disagreements. One from the left, one from the right. Both plausible, neither nearly as convincing as its proponents think. From the left, they say, somewhat rightly, that my definition of drugs and the war on drugs is too narrow. There's a hierarchy about how we define offenses. If I kill you in a drug deal gone bad, that's a violent crime, not a drug crime. If I steal from a store to feed my drug habit because drugs are more expensive because of the war on drugs, that's a property crime, not a drug crime. Drugs are the next level of sort of hierarchy. So in order to be in prison for a drug crime, the most serious thing you are convicted of has to be drugs. So the drug war turf battle and the theft for drugs don't show up in our prison data as drug offenses, they show up as violent and property crimes. So if I focus on people in prison for drugs, I'm excluding those things that do seem to be kind of tied to drugs. But it's more complicated than that. First of all, after you buy my book, the next book you should buy um, is this one called Ghetto Side by Jill Yobi, who's a LA Times correspondent who embeds herself with a homicide unit in South Central LA for several years. And one of the points she makes is that there's a wide array of studies across time and space so any place where you have young men and you deny them upward mobility and the state doesn't enforce laws against violence, they will kill each other. And it's true in the foothills of Tsarist Russia in the early, late 1800s, as much as it's true in South Central LA. Right? And she points out that is the story of South Central LA. Right? Lots of young men, they're cut off from the primary labor market. They don't have, the, their schools are defunded, their social networks aren't tied to the primary market. Upward mobility is very difficult. And the state has renounced its monopoly on violence. The clearance rate for murder, the percent of murders that result in arrest for LA County as a whole is about 60%. But one third of all murders in LA County don't get solved. Two thirds do. If the victim is a black male, that clearance rate drops to one third. So two thirds of all black male murders produce no arrest. Right? That's a complete renunciation of the monopoly on violence. And that will lead to violence amongst young men, no matter where they are, historically, culturally, geographically. Eliminating the war on drugs without addressing any of the underlying problems isn't going to solve that problem. The predicate cause of the deaths might change. Right? Instead of getting in a fight over drugs, getting in a fight over something else, but it's not gonna change the underlying social disorder that comes from no upward mobility and, and no adequate law enforcement. Right? And, and so it's not clear that ending the war on drugs would reduce violence so much as it would just sort of change its causes. And yes, people who are robbing to feed their drug habit will leave prison, there'll be fewer of them. But you have to ask yourself, why are people selling drugs in the first place? I mean, no one sells drugs because they want to sell drugs. They sell drugs because they don't have other more legal op options available to them because they are, again, cut off from the more primary labor market that most people hope to aspire to. 
If you end the war on drugs, legalize drugs, and the drug jobs go away, it's not like all of a sudden IBM jobs are going to flood in, right? And so they might be forced to turn to other illegal activity because they're still not having schools funded and job programs available that would solve the underlying structural problems that, that, produce them, that push them to sell drugs in the first place. And one anecdotal example of that is an article in the Times recently said that in New York City, drug gangs were starting to shift to identity theft. Right. As the drug market became less lucrative, they didn't start working for Google, they started doing ID theft. Right? Because they don't have the ability to get their resume read by someone at Google, and their schools aren't training them for the jobs at Google. Although, since it's ID theft, they're clearly picking up the skills that would be much more useful, but they, they lack the access to those markets. Right? So the impact of legalization alone will not nearly be as great as people hope if nothing else changes. The rebuttal from the right is, I just undermine the argument against prison reform. If everyone in prison is there for violence, good. Right? That's what we ought to have happen. Well, as I've just explained, prison's a very bad way to actually address violence. Right? It's not an effective approach to take. Plus, there's all the giant social collateral costs that come from, from prison that we have to pay attention to. But also, I think when talking about these costs, it's important to understand one of the really nefarious ways in which race plays its role in criminal justice. I think it's too little attention. And this ties us back a little bit to the prosecutor. Like I said before, the prosecutor is a county official. He's elected by the county. Crime is a disproportionately urban phenomenon. Most cities are not standalone counties. Most cities belong to a bigger county. Take Chicago. Chicago is part of Cook County. Half of Cook County lives in Chicago, half of Cook County lives outside of Chicago. Those ring suburbs have disproportionate political power. They're wealthier, they're whiter, they have higher voter turnout. They're not disenfranchised from prior records, they have a lot of clout. They play an outsized role in electing the DA. That DA then enforces laws in disproportionately minority urban cores of the, of the cities. This separates the costs and benefits of enforcement. Right? The suburbanites, they feel the safety of aggressive enforcement. Right? They feel safer going to work. They feel safer going to see a show on the weekends. The city feels safer. They feel safer. They're happy. This is great. Because it's not their brother, their uncle, their nephew, their son, their daughter, their cousin, their father, their mother, who's being needlessly stopped, needlessly arrested, unnecessarily convicted, incarcerated, put on parole with harsh conditions, right? Costs and benefits are separated. And the suburbanites feel all the benefit and have all the political power, while the costs are imposed on a completely different community that not only is geographically separated from them, but culturally and racially and economically separated from them as well, right? Oftentimes due to a long-standing history of government-sanctioned redlining and other barriers that have ensured that poor and minority Americans are concentrated in, in the cities and not allowed out into more suburban areas, right? So, you know, yes, there are costs. But there are serious costs to enforcement as well. And unfortunately, our system is designed such that those who feel the benefit are not those who impose the costs, are not those who feel the costs. And any Econ 101 class tells you to separate costs and benefits, bad policy emerges, right? A classic externality. Unfortunately, we remain in complete denial about the need to turn to violence. Uh, just before my book came out, when my editors would not let me destroy all the page counts by putting another paragraph or two and a couple charts in the book, Vox ran a survey about 3,000 Americans nationwide. Lots of questions about criminal justice, but two that stand out. The first question was, do you think majority of people are in prison for drugs? And they broke it down by liberal, moderate, and conservative. And what we see is the light blue line is yes, the orange line is 50%. A majority of liberals, moderates, and conservatives, and majority of all people said yes, about half of all people are in prison for drugs. It's 15%, not 50%. There's a difference between those two numbers, right? So we're fundamentally misinformed about who's in prison. But that's not the graph that really gets me. It's the next one. The next question was, are you willing to punish someone convicted of violence who poses little to no threat of recidivism? Are you willing to punish them less? Dark blue is no. 55% of liberals, 60% of moderates, almost 70% of conservatives said no. We've convinced ourselves that we can get out of this just by focusing on the low-level, nonviolent drug offender and remain unwilling to change how we approach people convicted of violence. But we have to, and we can, right? There are lots of better ways to deal with violence, and our, our idea of sort of locking people up is, is amongst the worst ways to approach it. But we've convinced ourselves we can do this on the cheap and not have to ask the really, really difficult questions about how should we punish people who have committed physical harm against other people. But if you really want to cut 50, right, as some people propose, that means cutting deeply 
in the percent of people who are in prison for violence. Finally, public prisons, private prisons. About 8% of all prisoners are in prison in a private prison. 92% are in a public facility. Public prisons hold almost all the prisoners. Almost all private prisons are in just, prisoners are held in just five states. And those states show no greater growth than other states and no greater reduction in other states. There's no evidence that having a private prison system in your state has any meaningful impact on actual prison population growth. Moreover, the problem with private prisons isn't profit, it's the contracts. We write really terrible contracts. So here's the, and, and the fact of the matter is if you give the same incentive to the public sector, the public sector acts just as badly. So here's an example. The classic private prison horror story, which is a legitimate horror story to be concerned with, is this. The state pays a private prison per prisoner per day. We will give you $20 for every prisoner for each day you have them. So what does the prison do? Well, to make a profit, it's got to cut funding so that they're spending less than $20 per prisoner per day. So they cut staffing, they cut training, they cut food, they cut programming, anything to get it down to like $14, $13, $12 a day. And then, of course, they want to fight reform, right? Because every prisoner is more money. So they want to keep population counts as high as possible, keep the laws as tough as possible, keep, make parole violations easy, just keep those bodies churning through their prison. And they take all that money and they take it out of the prison and give it to someone else, like their shareholders or someone else, right? Because that's what they're incentivized to do because we pay them per prisoner per day. Everything I've told you is terrible. And everything I've told you is what happened in Louisiana in their public prison sector. The state paid the sheriffs, the county sheriffs, the publicly elected county sheriffs per prisoner per day to house state inmates, state public inmates in county public facilities. And they paid them per inmate per day. And the sheriffs cut funding, cut programming, cut food costs, cut everything they could, and then took that money they got and took it out of the jail system and put it into the sheriff's department to buy cars and guns and armor for the sheriffs on the street, not for the jail. No private prisons in the story whatsoever. They come in later to help the private, to help the public sector build up their jail capacity. But the whole problem starts entirely on the public sector side. Nothing private. It's not about profit. It's about incentives. And we screw up the incentives on the private and public side alike. And we could fix it. Australia just opened a new jail, prison, run by Sodexo, which I don't know if that's your food provider, but it was mine in college, which is not a glowing endorsement. Um, but the contract is based on recidivism. You get paid not per prisoner per day who's in your prison. You get paid based on their prisoners who don't come back. Pennsylvania just did, did this with their halfway houses. They get a bonus if they keep their recidivism rate below a threshold and lose the contract if it goes above a threshold. Right. Now, it's in your own private incentive to actually fund programming and drug treatment and make sure the food is good and the health is good and the guards aren't undertrained and violent. Right? Because if people keep coming back, you keep not getting paid. Right? It's not profit, it's incentives. So one, private prisons aren't that big to start with. Two, the story we tell is the exact wrong story. They're profiting off misery. Well, two things. One, we can change how they profit to make them actually want to reduce that misery. And two, the public sector massively profits off misery as well. We spend $50 billion a year on prisons. 30 billion on jails and another 50 on prisons is 80 billion dollars on corrections. 50 to 75% of that spending is wages. That means in the prison system alone, 35 billion dollars is going to wages and benefits. In New York City, we spend 1.4 billion dollars a year on Rikers and 1 billion of that 1.4 billion is just going to guards and staffing. Not food, not uniforms, not wages and benefits. The private prisons make 400 million dollars a year in profit. The guard unions make $35 billion a year in wages. They're profiting immensely. And in case you can't see the gap between those numbers, I like graphs. So this gray line is 400 million. This orange is 35 billion, right? This is the private sector incentive. This is the public sector incentive. It's a huge incentive to fight reform. And the guard unions are really good at fighting reform. And no one talks about them. They're completely, you complain about Geo Group and CC, or Core Civic now, right? It's even changed its name to try to hide who it is because everyone hates them so much. Guardian unions don't change their name. They're proud of who they are. They're out there saying, we want more people in prison. This is what we do. 
right? This, we need these jobs. We need this is this is our livelihood, and they're they're proud of this, and they're the one set of unions: law, police, fire, and and correctional officers. The one unions even Republicans don't attack. Unions on the left won't attack them because they believe in union solidarity. Republicans on the right won't attack them because they actually tend to vote Republican, right? And they have tremendous power that we ignore. The politicians, the public sector politicians, have huge incentives too. So, jobs. Right? In many places, the prison is the one job in the area, or one, the, probably the best paying job. It, they, it brings in money and funds, and the politicians are going to fight for that. And even if that benefit is overstated, which it usually is, the constituents believe in it, and so politically they're going to maintain their prison quite aggressively. The census. I told you I'm going to talk about boring stuff. We're going to get really boring, but really important and kind of shocking. Interesting question the Census Bureau faces. Where does a prisoner live? Does he live where he was arrested? Or does he live in the prison? In all but four states, he lives in the prison. Most prisons, disproportionately, are not in cities. People in the prisons come from the cities. The prisons aren't. Prisoners are disproportionately black and brown people from cities. They're disproportionately Democratic voters. The rural areas where the prisons are, are disproportionately conservative. So we're moving about 1.5 million disproportionately Democratic voters out of the cities and moving them elsewhere, where they count as living. With a catch. Unlike everyone else in the county, in all but two states, they can't vote. There are state representatives all across the country who if their prisons close, their prisons shrink, they will lose their seat because they won't have enough bodies in their district to maintain equal proportion of repre representation. But the bodies they have in those prisons, it is, to be blunt, it's a five-fifths compromise. Right? At least under slavery, for disproportionate voting, slaves count as three-fifths of the person. Couldn't vote, only gave the South three-fifths for every vote, for every person there. In the prisons, it's five-fifths. They count as a full person, a full electoral person with zero right to vote. The impact can be great or small. In Pennsylvania, they believe it moves about five seats can move from the Demo Democrats to Republicans because of this. Given, well, before two weeks ago, that didn't mean much because Pennsylvania is so massively gerrymandered. Republicans had like a 400 seat majority. With the new maps that are coming out, that might actually matter. One of the four states that got rid of this gerrymander, the prison gerrymander, was New York. And when New York did it, the Senate majority, the Republicans were, had just lost their Senate majority, and they managed to convince the state to split one Senate seat in half to create a new Republican district because they knew they were going to lose a senator when this happened. And when the balance is one or two votes, that means literally the control of the New York State Senate turned on prison gerrymandering. This can matter. It's boring, it's technical, but it's vital. And it ties all back to this urban suburban split and rural split, right? That it's moving political power out of the cities into rural areas, and they will fight for this. Yet again, we tend to pay almost no attention to this. Right? You know, there was a push this year to reform the census, to make the census change how it counts people. Uh, it declined to do so, despite I think like 97% of all comments saying you ought to change it. Um, that's not surprising. Right? The four states that have stopped doing this um, are California, New York, Maryland, and Delaware. Deep blue, deep blue, deep blue, and deep blue. Right? And all four changed it during windows when the Democrats controlled the Senate, the, Leg the House, and the Governor's Mansion. That's how it has to be. Gerrymandering moves votes from Democratic areas to Republican areas. It has, and I mean this in a completely non-ideological way, a distinct ideological drift to it. And no Republican administration is going to encourage the Census Bureau to undermine Republican state-level support. Right, especially because the fact that Senate support turns on state support because that's where congressional districts get drawn. Right? So nothing's going to happen for the next, you know, for this census. Who knows what happened for the 2020 census. Right? Um, but it, you know, it, it is a very powerful political incentive to fight, fight reforms. There's also a deeper political problem that we're not really addressing, which is what we can call the, the Willie Horton problem. There are costs to being overly aggressive, and there are costs to being overly lenient. But those costs aren't symmetric. Right? If you're overly lenient, if you let out the person you didn't have to let out, that can really blow up in your face. Right? So most of you are probably too young to know who Willie Horton was. Willie, so in the 80s, Massachusetts had this furlough program. It would allow people to leave prison, to go home to their families, to see their families, and then to come back at the end of the weekend and check back into prison. Willie Horton was one such inmate. Willie Horton didn't come back. Willie Horton ran off to Maryland, broke into a home, beat up a boyfriend who lived in the home, raped his girlfriend, and gets rearrested. Several years later, when Michael Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts, is running for president against George H.W. Bush, 
they bring out Willie Horton as, as an attack ad. But the ad itself actually wasn't seen by anyone because it ran on cable in 1988, and no one had cable in 1988. Um, but the media firestorm about the ad, which is basically a, you know, they, they sort of know a, a, a large African-American man raping a white woman as one of the most racialized political ads in, in modern time, generate a whole story about one bad case will haunt you. Because here's the thing about that furlough program that, that I didn't know myself until I actually wrote this book. Its success rate, the number of people who came back without incident, was over 99%. No one violated this program. Everyone went along with it, except for one person. And he's now literally the euphemism for bad politics. Unless you think that, oh, that's the 80s, we're better now, no. Right? In 2013, Arkansas passed a wide range of sentencing reforms. And in a single year, their prison population dropped by 10%. But during that year, they paroled Daryl Dennis, single man in a very populous state. While on parole in 2013, Daryl Dennis committed a single murder. One man commits one murder. But he got a lot of political attention. And parole and probation and the judges got so scared that in a single year, with no legislative changes, that 10% decline became a 7% increase. Right? They just shut the system down and locked everyone back up. Right? Because you can have an ad. Look at this grieving family. You could have stopped this. Now, being overly severe, I can show you that. Right? If you look at table 16, risk pool A really shouldn't be in prison. Right? The risk of someone from pool A recidivates is really, really low. We don't need pool A in prison. But who's going to win the electoral ad? Right? My opponent has a grieving widow. I have column three on table 17. Right? I lose, he wins. And that asymmetry persists. We haven't fixed any of the political problems. We're just trying to ram through with the reforms that we can. Right? And sort of the example, I'm getting the, you need to stop talking now, look. Um, the example I sort of use to sort of make, drive this point home, in 1970, Congress abolished all mandatory minimum sentences for drugs. And one of the people in the House who got up and spoke on the floor of the House about how we had to abolish mandatory minimums. They were bad policy, bad morality, just overall bad, was Texas Representative George H.W. Bush, who as Vice President and President brought them all back. And now, we're trying to get rid of them all over again, except for heroin and fentanyl that we're bringing back as we get rid of all the others. It's a cycle. And unless we fix underlying politics, we're always going to overreact to the small things and underreact to the declines. Right? And no one's trying to fix the underlying political problems. We're just trying to ram through what we can, and the underlying system remains as broken as it currently is. It doesn't take much of an increase to get Alaska, where we started. Right? And again, I think there are things we can do to fix the politics, but we're, we're focused so much on sort of the privates that we're ignoring the massive public sector failure. Um, so I will stop there and happily answer any questions that, that people have. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, something you mentioned towards the beginning of your presentation was about how voters are partially responsible for this. Um, a lot of the, the things you mentioned today would potentially reduce recidivism, but how do you reconcile that with society's desire for retribution? So it's kind of, I do it partially as a joke, partially not, but in my book I dismiss retribution with one sentence, right? Literally one sentence. I say, you know, my focus is entirely on public safety. Right? If you believe in retribution, like, then things will be tougher. Right? And, but as an economist, I guess the retributive arguments are less interesting to me because either you believe it or you don't. Right? So a as a positive matter, our inherent retributive instincts matter quite a lot. Right? And they impose real political limits on what can be accomplished in the short run. But I also think that our, our retributive instincts are less permanent than they might seem right now. Those kinds of moral intuitions are much more malleable than we, we tend to think. So while we seem very retributist right now, you know, we are just as retributist in 1970 with the same crime rate and a massively smaller prison population. So I'm not convinced it's going to remain quite so harsh. Um, but you know, if you believe in harshness, then yes, you, know, you want more people in prison. And, there, and to me, there's not, there's not a big policy debate we can have about that. It's more of a moral debate, which is just not my my area of expertise. But yeah, it, is, it is a valid restriction on what might be politically feasible, especially in the short run. Hello, my name is Deja Curry. My question is, uh, how much does mental health play a role in incarceration? And what can we do about that? So I think one thing is always important to realize when talking about mental health and crime is that mental health, mental illness is a much bigger predictor of victimization than being the victimizer. Right? As much as we try to say, well, this person made a crime because they have a mental health problem. Actually, if I say this person has a mental health problem, are they a, do you, what, what are they? Are they the offender or are they the victim? You should always guess victim. 
right? And, and, my con and yes, the, our failure to treat mental health is significant, and it, does, it certainly makes matters worse. And certainly when mental health interacts with drugs and alcohol, it compounds even worse. I get concerned sometimes that our, our emphasis on the, 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 the mental, that our prisons are our front line on mental health. Well, yeah, but that's because there's an even much larger population of victims who aren't even identifying in the first place. So, yes, if we address mental health, it would reduce offending in prison populations. We'd probably do it more to reducing the risk of victimization than the actual sort of the need to rein in people who are actually the, the, the victimizers. Um, but expecting you know, Cook County Jail to be our nation's largest mental health hospital is terrible policy. Um, you know, there's, there's far more efficient public health approaches you could use than expecting sheriffs to be the front line on public health. Um, but, but I think that the, the biggest return would be on reducing people's exposure to risk, not their exposure to, to committing the harms in the first place. Yeah. Hi. When you discussed um, racial geography, you mentioned redlining. Can you please explain to the rest of the people in the room exactly what redlining is, and yes, Louisville, Kentucky has a strong history of redlining. Yeah, so redlining, it's, it's, it's a good term to define. So redlining, I mean, it, in this literal term, it was the idea that when the, when the federal mortgage broker, backer, in FHA and the other people that back, federally back mortgages, they literally draw lines in red ink on maps that would say we don't support the mortgages in these areas, and those areas were disproportionately African-American neighborhoods. So they would just not lend money to African-Americans in certain neighborhoods. Um, as a broader issue is things like, you know, GI Bill was not available to, to African Americans and it was available to white veterans. Uh, so a lot of, you know, white families were able to develop wealth through, you know, education and, and home ownership. Through the GI Bill, that was not African Americans, they were denied mortgages. It's, it, I mean, it, the problem persists to this day. Uh, but the term comes the idea of literally drawing a red line around neighborhoods that were African American. And sometimes as much as like, if, it, if a single African American family moved in the neighborhood, they would draw the red line around that and no one get a mortgage in the neighborhood at all. And so white families would fight like hell to keep African-American families out because the real estate market would collapse because the federal government as an explicit policy would not lend money in certain categories if, if there's too many African-Americans in neighborhoods, sometimes if a single African-American family was there. It exists in informal ways to this day. The New York Times sent an article the other day, I think about, I think, I can't remember exactly the example, but I think that the, the mortgage applicant was an African-American woman. She got denied until she had a co-signer who earned substantially less than she did, but was white. Uh, that's how she got her mortgage approved. Um, so it's, it's it, it, you know, we don't necessarily draw the exact same lines with like federal policy that we did before, but the, 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 the institution still persists to this day. It has been noted that many of the uh, correctional officers working in prisons are former military veterans who've done their 20 years. Uh, that qualifies them for good retirement benefits. And because of the decline in industries and rural areas, it seems to be that the only jobs that these guys can get that guarantees security and good job benefits is to become a correctional officer. So it would seem then that if, we're go if you want a reduction in prisons and the people who work there, you're going to have to find new jobs for these people that they can qualify for, yes or no? So one thing about the United States is it's always hard to tell a single national story, right? So the, the story you described, at least in terms of, I, I'm not aware about the veteran status, but certainly in terms of the general employment status holds true for New York, right? That many of New York's prisons are in these rural upstate areas with very few outside options. The exact opposite is true in Texas, right? Texas has, can't actually keep their prison staffed because there's so many other better jobs in rural Texas, like the oil fields, that they can't staff their prisons, right? So it's not a universal story, but you're right. And in fact, the way, so New York State had this issue where we'd actually shed about 25,000 prisoners between 1999 and 2010, but couldn't close any of our prisons, right? Because the guards were very good at keeping these prisons open. And the way that Cuomo actually finally broke that resistance was he offered about $30 million in subsidies and tax credits to try to encourage other industries to come to those communities, right? And so that, I think, I've actually argued that one way to try to actually encourage reform is to, at a much larger scale, try to you know, provide a certain amount of, of, of you know, employment in these, in these communities to, to offset the prisons. And one pretty intriguing part about that that complicates the standard narrative is the usual accounting of prison guards, and again, this is true in New York at least, is you know, it's, it's disproportionately rural white guards enforcing in, in the law in prisons that are, are populated by disproportionately African American and, and Hispanic inmates. And that's true in the north, far less true in the south. So the, 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 you've seen the larger spread of prisons in the south. And while prison towns in the south are more white than cities in the south, 
prison towns in the South are more minority than other equal-sized towns that don't have prisons, right? And, and so the, sort of the racial implications of, of decarceration in the South are a little more tricky because the towns that have prisons in the South are towns that were so unable to sort of get better jobs in, in part because they're more racially diverse, that they, they, they turn to the prison, which, which, which makes an argument in, even more in favor of, of a decarceration system that, that acknowledges the loss of jobs guards will face uh, from a normative point of view. Uh, and certainly from a political point of view, it seems to be, a, it, it probably strikes me as the strongest way to, to try to break the, the resistance the unions face, pose. So we've talked a lot about the politics behind getting people into prison and, you know, the guards and, what, and employees once they're inside, but how much would it be beneficial were the system to change from sort of just a penal punishment system to more of a reformatory rehabilitation system, particularly, you know, violence you go and get uh, people to talk through mental health stuff about that, or, you know, drugs you get sent to a drug program, how much would that alter the course of... Uh, the number of people who get sent back to the prison system after they've already been incarcerated? I mean, I think it would certainly help, right? I mean, arguably one could say, you know, some have argued that for all of our talk about second chance society, we should focus more on being a first chance society, right? Rather, rather than focusing on helping people once they've gone to prison to reintegrate back, we should invest those resources up front to make sure they don't have to go to prison in the first place, right? Um, but yes, I think in, the more we focus on things as a public health approach, the better things will be, right? So, and, and, and not just, you know, usually our arguments say, okay, how can we move criminal justice resources out of prisons into something more, less prison-y within criminal justice, right? I think we need to focus on how we move out of criminal justice altogether, right? Drug treatment expansion on the civil side, mental health treatment on the civil side, true public health responses. Um, I mean, it, it, is, it is gonna require you know, a massive culture shift. Um, you know, people often say, well, look at Europe and their prisons, they're radically different than ours, what can we learn from them? And what we can learn is that Europe is a really tough example for us to follow. Uh, so like in Germany, for example, their prison staff are not guards. They're not correctional officers. They're called staff, and they're viewed as mental health officials, not law enforcement, right? And they, you know, in the United, in New York City, we're trying to we're trying to massively increase the amount of training that Rikers guard city correctional officers need before they get deployed. And our goal is 34 weeks. In Germany, it's two years before you step onto the into the facility to actually be a guard or a, a staff member, right? And so, and I think their prisons function better as a result because it's not this antagonistic law enforcement approach, but actually more of a, a genuine rehabilitative approach. Um, but it requires just a radically different thinking, right? I mean, even even just think about design, right? You know, think about what an American prison looks like, right? And then the example I use, is sort of the extreme example, is Norway, right? So Anders Breivik, right? Anders Breivik was the man who shot and killed 75 children, kids in in Norway in that, in the great ma in that massacre several years ago. First of all, he got the maximum sentence for mass murder, which is 17 years, right? Uh, he's parole eligible after 17 years. That's the maximum they could get. His cell has no bars on the windows. It has two rooms, a private bath, private kitchen, TV, Xbox. Despite all of that, the state, the National Supreme Court found that it violated his human rights because of the limited human contact, right? That's Norway, right? That's the, the rehabilitative model that Scandinavia uses. Right? Then think about where we are. And you know, it, it, it shows sort of how far we, we have to go. Right? That, you know, for us, public health for opioids is giving officers Narcan, and sheriffs fight that across the country. Right? Maybe two cities are on the verge of safe injection sites. The third one is being undermined by the state legislature up in, up in Vermont, New Hampshire. Right? So yes, you're right. Like, uh, the more of a treatment public health approach we take to this, the better. But it's, for us, it's a, it's a huge cultural shift that's going to take a lot of time to, to accomplish. Two more questions. You talked at the beginning of the uh, presentation about in every dollar spent on policing, it actually produces like a dollar sixty benefit towards the city or the county or whatever. What exactly would you mean by putting the money into the police force? Would this be just simply putting more police officers on the street or just throwing money into the departments itself? Right. So a couple things about that, that number that deserve mention. One is that it's probably, so say you know, a dollar in policing reduces crime by about dollar sixty. Um, that's generally goes, to, the general idea is it probably goes mostly to staffing. It's officers on the street who matter. The one thing you should realize when you do these cost-benefit analyses of policing is that we actually don't account for all the costs of policing itself. Right? So the, the economic analyses say, okay, if we spend a dollar in policing and crime goes down by Y, that translates to a saving of $1.60 per dollar. Right? But it, police shootings don't count as crime. Right? Nervous community interactions with police, right? just, just a general fear you know, African-American men might feel interacting with a cop at any level doesn't figure into that calculation. Right? So there's no social cost of policing that 
count in those numbers, right? So they still might be an efficient use of money, but we, we should realize that they, they tend to somewhat overstate the, the benefit of policing because they just look at the crime reduction costs and ignore all the social costs that come with it, which makes other things like cure violence that, that focus on similar kinds of like street level interventions but not based on policing but based on community involvement more appealing because they, they don't have as much of that sort of social cost involved. Uh, but usually when they say, you know, put a dollar in, it means increased staffing because it's usually what really deters crime is the risk of detection. Right? The fact that you might get caught doing this. Not the punishment you're going to get. I mean, people commit crimes for young men, right? The idea that, well, if we make this sentence 10 years rather than five years, maybe this 18-year-old man who's, afraid, who's mad at his friend won't get in a fight. I mean, some of these politicians themselves were never 18 years old, right? Because I can tell you when I was 18, I was not doing complicated cost-benefit analyses about like, what did it mean to do this following thing, especially if you've been drinking that night, right? Um, but if there's like a cop standing there, like, maybe you don't get in that fight. Right? Because that, to an 18-year-old, yeah, I'm going to get busted now. Right? And that's what seems to work. That certainty and, 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 and immediacy of it. So it's about sort of getting the officers in the street, but then you've got to take into account the, the, all the various collateral costs that we measure very poorly that, that, that come from that. Uh, uh, thank you for your research. Uh, I'm Shelton McElroy. I'm a uh, Just Leadership USA Fellow, uh, 2016. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, uh, we believe, we, we lead with conviction, and so we're all uh, people that have been justice involved, and we believe that also uh, we're the least closest to power, but yet also uh, closest to the problem and closest to the solution. Um, here in uh, Kentucky in 2008, we passed House Bill 433 that uh, really reduced uh, our prisons and had um, the potential of great reductions. We've completely turned that corner. Now we're on a uh, very upward slope and to the point that we just reopened three private prisons to um, house uh, those, uh, those new incoming uh, incarcerated folks. Um, and I could go on and on. Uh, you talked about cure violence here in Louisville. I actually work for the office of the mayor, and we have an office called the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. We've built in a model of that cure violence. Uh, we're working right now on a pilot in one particular neighborhood uh, to reduce violence and uh, trying to gain support as cure violence and other people are doing in Oakland and et cetera. Uh, and so society has the stomach for this social change when we talk about juveniles, right? So we can look nationwide at the reduction of juveniles in institutions. The state of Kentucky, we've done a really good job. We've reduced that population by more than half. Um, and I, I just wonder how often when we focus these conversations, we're not looking in a mirror at ourselves and what we've decided we wanted the police to do, what we've decided we've wanted the courts to do. When we go to the ballot box, we say we want our suburbs to look like this. We want our University of Louisville campus to look like this. I don't want to step over some homeless guy as I'm walking on my way to class. And so we've created this monster. So, Yeah, I mean, the system we, no one, no one designed the system to do what it does, right? It's, it's, it's haphazard and chaotic and oftentimes mind-numbingly incoherent. But we're okay with the results that come from it, right? That, well, no one said that, say we're going to make this person responsible for that, that person responsible for this, no one's going to lie up here, no one's going to have responsibility for this, this is going to fall through the cracks, which is how it plays out. In the end, when we see the outcomes that we get, we do often seem kind of untroubled by them. Right? And so even if no one designed to do this, yes, like, I think the electorate plays a very, plays a, takes a huge responsibility for not pushing harder to change it once we understand how it doesn't work properly. Right? That lots of people are okay with the results. I think a lot of reason we are okay with the results is because of the way we separate the cost and benefits. Right? The residents feel okay because they don't feel that cost. And I, I'm, I'm increasingly in favor of devolving as much criminal justice responsibility to as local a level as is feasible. Right, to give the more local communities the bigger say in how the system runs, because they are the ones who feel the cost and the benefits. Right? I mean, another, I think, really important book out there is Jim Foreman's Locking Up Our Own. And the argument he makes is that you know, one of the cities with the harshest laws in the country was DC, which had, was the first area to actually have an African-American majority government. 
right? Because it, it affected them a lot, right? Crime it was disproportionately concentrated in the African American parts of DC. But his point is, look, they were asking for something radically different than what the suburbanites were asking for and what the white politicians were asking for, right? Congress tells DC, you have tough on crime or social support. And what the DC Council is saying, no, no, we want both, right? We want to stop crime as it's going on, and we want education money and social welfare money and other things to actually bolster employment opportunities and things that bolster things up. And I think if we listen to these local communities, you'll get a much more sophisticated, nuanced take on it. And the more we can let the communities most affected by crime have the biggest voice in crime, I think we'll have the most well-designed policies that, that balance enforcement with, with more social safety protection approaches. The problem we have today is that the people least, like you said, the people sort of most divorced from the experience of enforcement have the most say about how that enforcement plays out, and that's always going to lead to policies that are going to be mismanaged. All right, I want to thank you guys for coming for the BBT lecture, and thank John for giving it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.